Recently, my JFK assassination juices have been flowing again lately. My, my Lee Harvey Oswald juices have been flowing again lately. So I said, you know what? This is a topic that's been of interest to me for a long time. Why don't I throw in a little video out there on it? Um, and so here we go. This video is Lee Harvey Oswald sightings, impersonations, and the Harvey and Lee theory, a whirlwind tour in reverse. Now, what is the Harvey and Lee theory? This relates to the fact that if we look at the uh, evidence and the timeline of Lee Harvey Oswald, we there's places he was and evidence of what he was doing, but there's also substantial evidence of him being in more than one place at the same time or sightings where he couldn't have possibly been, uh, places where uh, it's very suspicious behavior of someone saying he was Lee Harvey Oswald or looking like Lee Harvey Oswald. And this has been known for a long time. Uh, in fact, the first book on this topic, you can see I have it right here, a book was released called The Second Oswald. This came out in 1966. This was very shortly after the Warren Commission came out. So it's been a topic floating around a long time. Uh, people like Bob Grodin looked at it in more detail in the 90s. And then in 2003, a gentleman named John Armstrong released a book titled Harvey and Lee. And he has a detailed overarching theory on what happened uh, and to try to explain all these sightings and impersonations. So we're going to go through that timeline and we'll talk about the Harvey and Lee theory. First, I want to give an incredibly brief sort of one slide official Lee Harvey Oswald timeline for dummies if you're not familiar with this timeline. He was born in 1939 in New Orleans. Uh, he bounced around a lot in childhood between Dallas area, New Orleans, and New York City. Spotty school attendance, the, the kind of jobs a teenager would have. In late 1956, he entered the Marine Corps for three years. And when he wasn't serving in the United States, he was uh, stationed in Japan. Uh, he came back in October 19. He came back in September 1959. In October, he promptly goes to the Soviet Union and says he wants to renounce his citizenship and defect to the Soviet Union. So he then spends two and a half years in the Soviet Union. He marries a, a Russian woman, Marina Prusakova. He's working in a radio factory in Minsk for most of that time. In June of 1962, he returns to the United States, uh, living and working uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth area, again in New Orleans. Uh, a lot of the time he's also unemployed. He wasn't a great employee. In September 1963, he allegedly made a trip to Mexico City where he tried to uh, figure out a path to return to the Soviet Union via Cuba, allegedly. We'll talk about that a little. Uh, that failed. In October 63, he gets a job at the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas. And then on November 22, 1963, uh, allegedly assassinates President Kennedy around 12.30 p.m. from a window of the depository. Allegedly, about 45 minutes later, shoots and kills a police officer, J.D. Tippett. And then uh, around 2 p.m. that day, he is arrested at the Texas Theater. Less than 48 hours after that, on Sunday the 24th, he is shot and killed by Jack Ruby on live television with 50 police officers standing around. So that's the sort of one slide Oswald history. So we're going to go through the history of the sightings and double Oswalds and impersonations. But, you know, I could start at the beginning of this, but the other day I was thinking of the movie Memento and I said, you know what, to add a little spice and to make sure you, the audience, is paying attention, let's go in reverse. Let's start at the end and go f and all the way back to the beginning. And uh, this is sort of inspired by the movie Memento. As you can see here, it was just maybe also a way to work Carrie Ann Moss into this presentation. So here we go. We're going to cover the whole Lee Harvey Oswald story, and we're going to not start at the beginning. We're going to start at the end. And this isn't the end end, but it's the end for the purposes of our talk today. So right now, we'll talk about November 22nd, 1963 at 2 o'clock p.m. So what time is this? This is in all likelihood, just after Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested at the theater as in the custody of Dallas PD. Well, right around that time or shortly afterward, an auto mechanic named T.F. White, who uh, is working a few blocks from the Texas theater, he sees a red Ford Falcon uh, driving up and down the street, speeding, behaving erratically, 
and then it parks almost like it's ki trying to kind of hide behind a sign. And um, Mr. White approaches this car, and when he approaches the car, the driver sees him and speeds away. So uh, Mr. White records the license plate. And then a little later that afternoon, when we see this Lee Harvey Oswald on the news, he says, hey, you know what? That guy I saw on the Red Ford Falcon, that looked a hell of a lot like Lee Harvey Oswald. So he contacts the FBI, and they immediately interview him about this. Um, he also talks to a journalist named Wes Wise about this. So they run the license plate. The license plate was registered not to that Red Ford Falcon, but to a different car. And this car was owned by a gentleman named Carl Mather. Carl Mather was best friends with J.D. Tippett, the police officer who was shot and killed that day, allegedly by Oswald. And the Mather family and the Tippett family were, were all very, very good friends, best friends. That's strange. Also strange about Carl Mather, he works at Collins Radio. Collins Radio was a... Uh, radio and electronics company did a lot of military and intelligence agency work in fact Carl Mather worked on Lyndon Johnson's airplane so we have the car registered to this guy he's friends of the Tippett family he works at a uh, CIA and intelligence affiliated electronics company and oh by the way another employee of Collins Radio was a gentleman named Kenneth Porter Kenneth Porter shortly after the assassination befriends and eventually marries Oswald's widow, Marina Oswald. Uh, if you see footage of Marina Oswald later in life, it'll say her name is Marina Oswald Porter. She married Ken Porter of Collins Radio. So just a small town, huh? Dallas, all the, that all these people are connected in this strange incident. Oh, by the way, Wes Wise, the journalist there mentioned, he went on to become mayor of Dallas later. Dallas is just a small town, baby, in 1963. Just a small town. So let's move a little early, earlier in the day to almost 2 p.m., which was the time of the Oswald arrest at the Texas Theater. Now, he was arrested in the lower level of the theater, and he was brought out the front of the theater. There's a very famous photo of him in handcuffs being led out of the theater. So that happened. Um, the story is in the police car going to the police station, they got a wallet off of Oswald, and the wallet contained IDs with two names, Lee Harvey Oswald and another name, Alec Heidel. Alec Heidel is an important name. It's the name under which Oswald handed out communist literature over the last two years, and it's also the name under which he allegedly ordered the rifle used to kill the president. So he was led out the front of the theater, but a nearby hobby store owner named Bernard Hare, he worked a few doors down. He was standing in the alleyway behind the theater when all this was going on. He was standing behind a theater. He saw police cars back in the alleyway. He saw a man brought out of the theater out the back and stuffed into a police car and hauled off. Bernard Hare, for the next 30 years, thought he saw Oswald getting arrested. And then later on in the 90s, the film crew for the movie JFK was talking to Bernard Hare. Bernard Hare mentions that, oh, I saw Oswald getting arrested and brought up the back of the theater. They said... You couldn't have seen that because Oswald was brought out the front front of the theater. So Bernard's Hare says, well, then who the hell was arrested and brought out the back of the theater? Great question, Bernard. Who was it? We don't know. So was anyone else arrested that day at the theater? There's no official record of that. However, some of the documents around the arrest of Oswald place him in the balcony at the time of the arrest, not the lower level. So that's a odd discrepancy. You think all the paperwork should agree on where Oswald was arrested, but it doesn't. If we go a little bit earlier, 1.30 p.m., uh, this is in the immediate aftermath of the shooting of the police officer, J.D. Tippett. So as I said, Oswald had a wallet on him with two IDs uh, in the police car. However, a second wallet allegedly found at the Tippett murder scene, which also contained IDs for Lee Harvey Oswald and Alec Heidel. A police captain named Pinky Westbrook was waving this wild around, showing people the IDs, saying, hey, do you know who Lee Harvey Oswald is? Hey, do you know who Alec Heidel is? Uh, an FBI agent on the scene, Bob Barrett, testified to all of this. Uh, other people at the scene testified to seeing these IDs. And in fact, this whole incident was videotaped. You can watch this on YouTube. 
a television newsman filmed this. You can see people at the J.D. Tippett scene fiddling around with a wallet. So what is this second wallet? If we have two wallets, both with real ID and a fake ID for Oswald, I mean, this is incredibly damning. So this second wallet, the Tippett scene allegedly doesn't exist. But what is it? Was it an attempt to frame Oswald? Some apologists have tried to say, well, this was the real wallet, but uh, it got somehow confused for the fact that a wallet was found on Oswald in the police car, and there really was no wallet, wallet found uh, for Oswald in the police car. Nobody knows. All we know is this wallet is a mystery. Uh, Captain Westbrook is considered a very shady character by multiple authors, and this whole incident's a problem with the wallets. If we go a little earlier to around 1.15 p.m., we're talking about the exact time J.D. Tippett was shot. The official narrative around Oswald's whereabouts here is that he left his rooming house in Oak Cliff a little after 1 p.m., walked 10th and Patton, which is 9 tenths of a mile. So we're talking about, you know, you would figure at least a 15-minute walk. He uh, shot Officer Tippett around 1.20 p.m. and arrived at the Texas Theater around 1.30 p.m. That's the official narrative. We have very good evidence that he did leave the rooming house after 1 p.m., so we feel pretty confident about that timestamp. However, a lot of the witnesses to the Tippett shooting place it earlier than the Warren Commission. They place it between 1.06 and 1.10 p.m., and that includes people looking at their watches right as they saw someone get shot, uh, Hearing, hearing news times on television. There's many witnesses that place this shooting early. Too early for it to be Oswald unless he teleported or got a ride from the rooming house at 10th and Patton, or it wasn't the same Oswald. And as far as arriving at the Texas Theater at 1.30, well, the uh, ticket taker slash concessions guy, Butch Burrows, he said in an interview, he places the time of Oswald arriving at 1.10 to 1.15 p.m., which is way too early to have be at the theater and also have shot Tippett. You know, when you work at a movie theater, you have an okay sense of time because you know when movies are starting, you know when the little cartoon reels before the movie are starting. So Burroughs is basing this time based on all, all of that. Uh, there's another witness, Johnny Brewer, who puts Oswald entering the theater at 1.30, and there's questions about him. So we won't get any more into the Tippett shooting, but there's a lot of eyewitnesses to either the shooting or the immediate aftermath, and there's a lot of conflicting testimony on how much the shooter, or potentially more than one shooter, uh, actually resembled Oswald. So we now look at 12.35 p.m. to 1 p.m. This is the time in between the Kennedy assassination and Oswald being at his rooming house. So the official narrative here is that Oswald shot Kennedy, ran into a police officer in the second floor lunchroom of the depository, Marion Baker, and then left the rear of the building, got on a bus. The bus got stuck in traffic, so then he got off the bus and got on a cab to go back to Oak Cliff. That's the official narrative. There's a number of witnesses who conflict with this narrative, including a sheriff's deputy named Roger Craig, and you can see him being interviewed about this on YouTube. He saw a man resembling Oswald come out the front, toward the front, from the front of the depository, come down the lawn, and hop into a Nash Rambler station wagon uh, about 10 minutes after Kennedy's shooting. He's not the only witness to this. We have four or five other witnesses who all independently say they saw a guy, Oswald-looking guy, come down the lawn and hop in a Nash Rambler. In fact, several of them, they noticed all this because they had to hit the brakes in their car to not hit this Nash Rambler in front of them. And then this Oswald-like character hops in. Uh, subsequent to that, we do have testimony of two residents of Oak Cliff who say they saw a, a, a guy get out of a station wagon, make a panicked phone call on a laundromat payphone, and then leave around 12.50 p.m. And by Oak, remember, Oak Cliff is the neighborhood where Oswald had a rooming house and the typical shooting happened. So that's another station wagon Oswald sighting. And then after that, so other people saw Oswald, or someone who looks like Oswald, walking around near the Tippett scene just after 1, but not on the path between 10th and Patton and the Tippett scene. So those other little sightings really conflict with what could have reasonably been the, the official whereabouts of Oswald. 
if we go to all the way to 12.30 p.m., which is right at the time of the assassination, we're not going to get too deep into the weeds here, but uh, Oswald uh, allegedly had lunch around 12.15, shot Kennedy from the sixth floor just after 12.30, was in the lunchroom about 90 seconds later where he ran into this police officer, Marion Baker, and then he left. Uh, other witnesses, including at least one depository employee, uh, Mrs. Reed, saw a man who looked kind of like Oswald, but had a white t-shirt, uh, not a brown shirt, uh, you know, walking around the depository. That sounds like the Nash Rambler guy at first blush. In addition to that, in the few minutes before the assassination, many witnesses saw more than one person on the sixth floor Many of them say one of them was very Oswald looking, and a lot of them say another person looked kind of Hispanic looking. Some of them say they saw two people with rifles. This includes witnesses on the street. This includes witnesses actually in a jail across the street who were watching all this. And there's a and a lot this just conflicts with the idea of one shooter on the sixth floor uh, that was Oswald when he seemed to be having lunch on a different floor at that time. Don't worry, we're not going to go in half-hour increments for the entire presentation here. We're going to go start stretching things out a little. So the morning of November 22nd, Oswald uh, stayed overnight at Ruth Payne's house where his wife Marina was staying. He hitches a ride to work with a co-worker, Buell Frazier. Buell Frazier said Oswald had a paper bag about two feet long that Oswald said contained curtain rods. The curtain rods will be important in a minute. Meanwhile, a, uh, a record store near the Texas Theater, uh, the proprietor there said he sold tickets to a show to Oswald about 7.30 that morning when Oswald couldn't have possibly been there. A clerk in a mini mart near the Texas School Book Depository at 9.30 said he, sh he sold beer to Oswald and that the guy showed a driver's license and he recalled the name as Lee or O.H. Lee, something like that. There's two problems with that. One... Oswald was working. Well, there's three problems. One, Oswald was working. B, he allegedly didn't drive and didn't have a driver's license. And C, he didn't drink beer. So who is this Oswaldish guy buying beer? Um, if we go all the way back to 2.15 a.m. that morning, um, a waitress at a restaurant who knew Jack Ruby said Jack Ruby and Oswald were at the restaurant together. And this is the last sighting of Ruby and a Lee Oswald character. There are many, many, many more when we go backward in time. We scoop back a little earlier to November 20th. That's Wednesday, two days before the assassination. Allegedly that morning around 10 a.m., an Oswald-like person and J.D. Tippett were eating at a restaurant near Oswald's rooming house at the same time around 10 a.m. Now, Oswald was at work at that time. He couldn't have been eaten there. This Oswald was noisy and belligerent, uh, and really, Oswald was generally not known to be like that. But who is this person? Also that day, an airstrip owner named Wayne January said Oswald and two other people were in a party of three inquiring to him about whether they could get a flight to the Yucatan Peninsula on the afternoon of November 22nd. Take, take that what you will. Another very intriguing witness, Ralph Leon Yates, who was a uh, driver for a uh, refrigeration company. He said a few days before the assassination, the 20th here, he picked up a hitchhiking Oswald in Oak Cliff and drove him to the vicinity of the depository. This Oswald was carrying a package. He said he was curtain rods. He showed him a photo of himself with a rifle and a pistol, and he asked Yates if he thought you could kill the president from a high office building when he's in town in two days. Well, that's that's a hell of a story, huh? So, uh, Yates was interviewed about this on November 26th, four days after the assassination. So it's not like he had ages to cook up some sort of story. He says he told a co-worker that day, the 20th, this whole story, and the co-worker testified to the FBI. Yes, Ralph Yates told me this story the day it happened. Um... What I'd love to know is, was the Buell Frazier curtain rod story of taking Oswald to work that day, was it already public? If it wasn't yet on the 26th, this is an incredibly damning incident. Like, what is this? What happened to Yates? Well, he 
he took four lie detector tests. They didn't show he was lying, whatever you want to think of lie detector tests. Eventually, he stuck to the story so fervently that he was committed to a mental institution because he was claiming a story was too that true that couldn't possibly be true because Oddwalls was at work while all this was going on on the 20th. He, he wasn't hitchhiking anywhere. He was at the school book depository. How about the rest of the month of November 1963? Oswald had a very boring routine. He would work every day at this depository. He'd go to this rooming house in Oak Cliff at night. And he would spend the weekend in Irving, Texas at Ruth Payne's with his wife and his uh, kids. So there's many sightings that conflict with this. There was somebody test driving a Mercury Comet on November 2nd. Um, there's a belligerent customer at a Fort Worth gun shop on November 2. There is a testimony of a gentleman named James Markham who said he met Oswald uh, at, I believe, a bowling alley. A few days later, they saw a movie. And after the movie, Oswald was talking about killing Kennedy. There was a Oswald and Marina-like character who spent a couple hours at the Irving Furniture Mart. Uh, the, the Marina person didn't speak English. Uh, she apparently, they, they spoke in a foreign language, this Oswald and Marina. There were repeated sightings at... Uh, various places in Dallas and Irving, like Hutch's Supermarket and Cliff Chastain's Barbershop. Remember, all of these sightings are when Oswald is at the depository and he can't possibly be doing these other things. He attended work every day from the day he started work there to the day he was killed. We also have visits to the Sports Drome Rifle Range where a Oswald-like person was there. One time he caused a stir by shooting at someone else's targets. He apparently had an old Italian rifle. Someone there helped him sight in a rifle. Um, there's no actual evidence that this was really Oswald. Because A, this person drove and Oswald didn't drive. And then B, he was with Marina at these times. And then again, as usual, there are sightings with Jack Ruby and or at the Carousel Club. There's even an alleged quick trip to Mexico at this time. I want to emphasize here when I say sightings... It's often not just, oh, I saw a guy somewhere and he looked like Oswald. Frequently, this is giving a name, Lee Oswald, talking about communism, talking about Marxism, saying he used to live in the Soviet Union. I mean, that varies from sighting to sighting, but whenever I discuss these things, it's not just I saw a guy and it's this Oswald-looking guy. It's There's often more information than that around these sightings. So if we look at October 63... Uh, Oswald started work at the depository on the 16th. Meanwhile, on October 3rd, Oswald uh, let, uh, technically, in the official narrative, had spent a few days in Mexico and then spent the night at the YMCA in Dallas. But an Oswald character, giving that name, saying he was just in Mexico, was looking for jobs in the radio industry in Alice, Texas. Uh, there were more sightings at barbershops, grocery stores, rifle range that... Don't align with Oswald's known locations. Um, there's the whole story of Laura Cottrell and the Texas Employment Commission. The Texas Employment Commission is kind of like an unemployment agency where you would go, you get interviewed, you take tests, they help people find jobs. She claims she uh, talked to one Oswald a few times and then another time, after Oswald already was working at the depository, a slightly different looking guy came in who also said he was Oswald. Um... There was possibility that there's is, is a gentleman named Larry Crayford who we'll discuss later. Even Laura Cottrell thought it may have been Larry Crayford. We'll get into that a little more later. There were other things. He was allegedly at a coffee gathering in Grand Prairie, Texas uh, on Thursday the 24th. And he was allegedly apartment hunting in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with a Marina character on the 25th mentioning Russia, me mentioning Kennedy, mentioning Marxism. Now... I'd like to juxtapose these two because Grand Prairie, Texas is near Dallas, and then Baton Rouge is 400 plus miles away, so there's a good chance these two sightings are not the same person unless uh, the, same, the same person they teleported or drove all night. I just want to show we don't have to mindlessly swallow every sighting we see as being the same person. To round out October, there was someone job hunting in Dallas and Irving on the Thursday the 31st while Oswald was working at the depository again. Sometimes it gives the name of Oswald, uh, and who is this person? 
September 26th, October 3rd is the alleged trip to Mexico City where he, this, this Oswald or Oswald-like person was noisily trying to get back to the Soviet Union, possibly th by getting a transit visa through Cuba first. A ton of work's been done on this whole trip. We won't get into it in a ton of detail, but I'll just note uh, for the purposes of today. On the 26th, uh, Oswald should have been en route to Mexico, but this is the day where there was what we call the Silvio, Silvia Odio encounter in Dallas, where she was a uh, anti-Castro uh, uh, woman living in Dallas, and she sort of dealt in those anti-Castro circles, and three guys showed up at her house. She said one gave his name as Leon Oswald and looked like Oswald. As far as the actual time at the embassies it, for the Cuban embassy and the Soviet embassy, they these were very heavily surveilled by the United States, and the U.S. could not come up with any photos of anyone resembling Oswald. They came up with some photos, and they looked nothing like Oswald whatsoever. There was at some point a, a phone call from Oswald to the embassy, but the phone call person spoke good English and bad Russian. And, I'm sorry, good Spanish and bad Russian, and Oswald spoke outstanding Russian and virtually no Spanish. Even the eyewitnesses uh, had great disagreement on what this Oswald looked like, uh, his demeanor, and much, much more. It's very hotly debated among research to this day whether Oswald was there for some of the time, all the time, or none of the time, he was alleged. If we look at summer of 63, uh, Oswald moved to New Orleans and worked at a coffee company for a while. And uh, these are times where also he's handing out uh, pro-Cuba and pro-communist leaflets, doing things like that. It's also the time of the alleged activities with David Shaw, uh, sorry, Clay Shaw and David Ferry. Uh, you see all that in the movie JFK. So in this time when, Os when Oswald, we think we have a grasp of activities, a number of witnesses claim to have met Oswald at Cuban exiled training camps in Louisiana, and this would include time when he was working at this coffee company and couldn't have possibly been at exile training camps. And why would a pro-Cuba person be at Cuban exile training camps anyway? There's uh, a lot of sightings of, uh, with Jack Ruby again in Dallas. Many, many witnesses to this. Often they give a name, a name of Lee or a name of Ozzy. The guy looks like Oswald. Uh, it doesn't comport with the official narrative, which is that Oswald and Ruby didn't know each other at all. Um, Oswald allegedly was in Mexico in July, according to the always enigmatic Richard Case Nagel. We won't get into the Nagel story now. There was the Jackson and Clinton, Louisiana sightings in August, which are, again, this, this Clay Shaw stuff. There's the Robert McEwen incident around Labor Day 1963. This is incredibly intriguing. Robert McEwen was a gun runner. He was a gun runner for Fidel Castro. He and Castro were best buddies. In uh, summer of 63, he was on probation and living in Texas. He said around Labor Day, two guys show up uh, at his house, one a Latin looking guy and the other, a guy who introduced himself as Lee Oswald. They tried to buy four uh, Savage 300 rifles from McEwen at this greatly bloated, inflated price. McEwen says to them, why would you order rifles from me? You could get these rifles at, at Sears. Uh, why do you need them from me? So Oswald was adamant. He tried to buy the rifles. He then left. He tried to buy the rifles again. McEwen had none of it. Oswald leaves. So what, right at the, on the day of the assassination, McEwen and his friend are watching TV. They see this picture of Oswald on television and, and, his friend says, Mac, that's the guy who tried to buy rifles from you a, a few months ago. And McEwen's like, yeah, it looks like him. McEwen ultimately gave this whole story to the HSCA in the 70s. It's recorded. It's on audio. You can listen to it. If this is, is true and it's not the real R.V. Oswald, this is damning. This is a direct attempt to tie buying rifles to Fidel Castro's gun guy. So that's an incredibly important story. Besides that, we finally have the oddity of uh, guest book signings in Wisconsin in mid-September where someone named Lee, Har Lee Ar Oswald, another one said Lee Oswald Dallas, was signing in hotels in Wisconsin. John F. Kennedy was giving a speaking tour in the Midwest at that time. 
And Lee Harvey Oswald was not known to be touring Wisconsin uh, in mid-September. He was, he was in New Orleans. So yet another strange thing. Or there's just a bunch of guys named Lee. It's just a common name, Lee Harvey Oswald. If we scale it a little longer, June 62 to April 63. Remember, June 62 is when Oswald returned from the Soviet Union. Uh, for In all that period, he had a couple jobs, a welding company job, a printing company job. Sometimes he was unemployed. This is a pretty quiet period in the unusual sightings front. There's a, there's a few of note. Uh, I mentioned them there. And I think there's a reason why this is a quiet period, which I'll touch on a little later. We're going backward in time. I hope you're not getting lost. Summer of 63. Oh, sorry. Wrong way. If we uh, then look at the Oswald's time in the Marines. This is October. I'm, I'm sorry. This is the time he's in the Soviet Union. E even I'm getting confused. See, I, I chastise you for getting confused. Now I'm confused. Oswald is in the Soviet Union from October 59 to June 62. There's no evidence ever that he left the country in that whole time. So that stopped the Oswald sightings elsewhere? Of course it didn't. There were further sightings of Oswald at exile training centers in Louisiana and Florida, and Marie de Lorenz is one of the people who testifies in that regard. There are several car and truck buying attempts, including Bolton Ford in 1960 and a, a Chevrolet dealership in 61. Now, the Bolton Ford one, he goes in, he says he wants to buy trucks, to support Cuba or support some revolution somewhere. They have the original card from Bolton Ford, they, like the card that they'll fill out when someone comes and visits them. They have the name Oswald on it. Oswald was in the Soviet Union at this time. There was a meeting in Havana in 1961 that someone claims was Oswald. An Oswald-like character was arrested in New Orleans in October 61. There's records that he that an Oswald took tests at the Texas Employment Commission in April 62. There's other sightings in the South and Southeast United States at that time. Some of them involved Jack Ruby. There's even a memo from J. Edgar Hoover himself in 1960 that talked about the possibility that someone was using the passport of the Lee Harvey Oswald that was in the Soviet Union. And this was around the uh, alleged interest of Oswald in the Albert Schweitzer College in Switzerland. We won't get into that. But anyway, the notion of a second person using an Oswald identity was all the way under the radar of J. Edgar Hoover. And then finally on this slide, for the any, any fans out there, the old TV show Barney Miller from the 70s, Barney Miller, there was an actor on that show, sort of reddish brown hair, named Steve Landisberg. He was one of the detectives. There's a bizarre story that an Oswald character and Steve Landisberg were acting as provocateurs in New York in 1960 and 61, sort of being provocateurs at NAACP meetings and, and other sort of left-wing meetings, things like that. I'll, I'll talk about that more a little later, but that's a wild, wild stuff. Steve Landisberg. Now we get to Oswald's time from in the Marines, which is October 56 to December 59. This is where we get to the kernel of the Harvey and Lee theory that we mentioned all the way at the beginning. So Oswald uh, entered the Marines in 56. There's documents and witness testimony that seem to place Oswald in two separate paths in the Marine Corps in mid-1957. There's one group of witnesses say, oh, I was with Oswald here and Jacksonville training at this time, and there's some other witnesses that say, no, I was serving in so-and-so with Oswald at this time. So when we get around to late 1957, early 58, there's multiple witnesses that testify that a, the young Lee Harvey Oswald was not in the Marines, but he was working with them at Pfister Dental Laboratory in New Orleans in late 1957 to 1958. Lee Harvey Oswald was officially in Japan for this whole time. How do these witnesses put this at the time? Um, one of them, named Palmer McBride, he, uh, he, he dates this very specifically in various ways. He says, well, we went to an opera in New Orleans, a Russian opera. The only time that Russian opera was in New Orleans was in this time frame when Oswald was technically in Japan. He said they talked about the release of the novel that was released in Russia, that uh, it was Dr. Zhvago. And that 
it was released in, in the United States in 58. They can't possibly be talking about it in 1956. Other witnesses, there's another witness who said he ran an amateur astronomy club for teenagers, and that absolutely didn't start until 1958, and Lee Harvey Oswald was definitely attending it. I mean, these are witnesses that have very, very strong time stamping of this time frame. But the official narrative is it couldn't have been Oswald, he was in Japan. And then we get to the real kernel of the Harvey and Lee theory here. If you look at September 1958, this is Oswald is going between Japan and Taiwan. There's a bunch of records, medical records, travel records that conflict, that can't possibly be the same person. These records are so bad, the House Select Committee in the 1970s actually looked at this issue in detail and ultimately had to decide, well, Oswald must not have gone to Taiwan. The records are wrong. But what the Harvey and Lee theory of John, Os of John Armstrong posits is that at this time, the two Oswalds that were both in the Marine Corps at this time switched identities, that we switched the identity of who he calls Harvey Oswald, who is a native Russian speaker, we swapped his identity into the identity of this native-born guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, and they did this to present a sort of composite identity person to subsequently sneak into the Soviet Union as a false defector. We'll discuss that theory a little bit more in the next slide, some of the mechanics of it. Um, so John Armstrong, both in the Marine Corps time the time afterwards, and even the time before the Marines, he has parsed out two Oswalds with distinct traits, and not just physically, but also behavior-wise. The Oswald that we saw get arrested and killed by Jack Ruby was a little bit smaller. He was a timid guy. He obviously loved to talk about communism. He spoke Russian. He was a teetotaler. Armstrong contrasts this with a lot of witnesses who met some Oswald or other in their lives, either in the Marines or otherwise, say, well, no, actually, he was a little bigger. He was uh, uh, a little bit of a more violent guy. He liked to drink. He didn't read. He didn't discuss philosophy. He wasn't into those things. So he really draws out two identities with two different personalities over time. So just to wrap up the Marine Corps time here, witness testimony uh, shows that possibly an Oswald was discharged from the Marines in 19 March 59, whereas he wasn't officially discharged until September. And there are then sightings in Florida and Louisiana between March and September 59 that don't comport with the official timeline of when Oswald left the Marines. If we go back to Oswald's teen years, which are 1953 through October 56, when he then go, went into the Marines, so Oswald and his mother officially lived in New Orleans, Dallas, New York City, floating around at these, these times. There's witnesses that place him in a couple other possible locations, including California, and the very strange Stanley, North Dakota story. And then the school records and the employment records also show occasional points where it seems like there's two Oswalds existing simultaneously in two different places. So... To revisit, again, John Armstrong's Harvey and Lee theory of what has been happening all these years. So Armstrong posits that there was a U.S. government program to try and get a native Russian speaker into the Soviet Union as a false defector. So how would they go about that? They would uh, look for children who were orphaned by, in World War II and who spoke Russian. Now, before World War II and then during it, there were a lot of refugees from Europe that came to the United States. Some of them were from countries that were not Russia per se, but a certain percentage of the population would speak Russian, whether it be Romania, whatever, countries bordering Russia. So uh, Ar uh, Armstrong theorizes that they would look among these uh, children to possibly find native Russian speakers, and then you find a regular plain old American who's living a regular American life, and at some point you have the one give the identity to the other. Now, why do you have to do this identity swap? 
Armstrong says that, well, if someone defects to the Soviet Union, the first things the Soviets are going to do is investigate him, look into his background. And if you see in someone's background some formal language training in Russian, well, you've put the you've, – you've given up the game there. You have someone sneaking around who speaks Russian who isn't supposed to speak Russian. So he theorizes this as a way to get around that. And he even cites the case of another spy in, in the U.K., who had similar circumstances to this. We won't get into that. So what happened? We had the defection of the Soviet Union. And then after the defection, you then have these two guys. One is the, the Lee Harvey Oswald we know, who was married, married to Marina in Dallas and Fort Worth. Well, where's the other Oswald? It's possible this other Oswald was the person we just see operating in Cuban exile circles and things like that uh, in that interfering period in between the defection and the summer of 63. So uh, John Armstrong would further say by summer 63, as plots were being hatched to assassinate JFK, that they uh, reactivated the guy Lee, Har Har Lee Oswald, the guy who gave his identity away, and said, well, maybe we can evolve him in a elaborate attempt to frame this other Oswald for the assassination of Kennedy. Whew. How about that's a mouthful, huh? Now, if you have two Oswald kids, you have to have two mothers. And yes, John Armstrong, he does it. He documents two Marguerite Oswalds from 1953 all the way into the early 1960s. And he, they have different personalities. They look different. They work in different places. He tries to provide evidence of this whole scheme. He thinks in photographs they look substantially different. I'm as not sure about that. As far as Oswald's brother Robert, John Armstrong thinks he had to be in on all this because he would he had dealings with both the native-born guy Lee Harvey Oswald and this alleged other person who got his identity swapped in and eventually was uh, framed and killed by Jack Ruby. That's a heck of a theory, huh? So, wow, let's look at some critiques of all this what we've just heard and seen. And there are many. These aren't the only ones I list here, but there's quite a few. Some say that some of these sightings are Oswald, actually other specific people. And Larry Crayford is one notorious example. Is Larry Crayford was a sort of a, a one of these creepy carnival guys, you know, who works at a carnival. And then eventually the carnival came to Dallas and he got hired by Jack Ruby as a handyman at uh, Jack Ruby's club. So that's, that's not bad. You could say this sighting or that sighting in, say, November 1963 was not Oswald. It was actually Larry Crayford. The problem is Crayford did not meet Ruby until the middle of October 63 and didn't start working at the Carousel Club until November 63. And there's sightings of Ruby and Oswald together going way back before that into October, into summer 63. So Larry Crayford can't be all those sightings. Larry Crayford is an interesting story. Uh, in and of himself, but he can't be all the Oswald sightings for sure. And there's some other names I give there. So, again, Oswald, look at him. He's like the most generic-looking 1963 guy ever. So maybe a lot of these sightings are really just some other guy who looked like Oswald, and people are just mistaken. Like, if you see a guy eating in a diner on November 20th, maybe that's really not Oswald. So... Maybe there was another Oswald who lived in Texas and Louisiana at this time, but was completely unrelated to any other plots. I think, I don't want to attribute something to a guy if he didn't say it, but I think the author Gerald Posner, who wrote a pro-Warren Commission book, I think he threw out a theory in this regard that, oh, Lee Oswald was just a common name, and uh, these sightings of a Lee Oswald are just, you know, it's some other dude completely unrelated. Now, it could be a completely unrelated guy. It could have been, as I said, the Lee Oswald who was in the Marines and who gave his identity away, just oper just doing what he wanted to do at times, working in uh, unrelated Cuban exile circles. Maybe. Uh, fourth bullet point here, people are just making stuff up. That's always an option, right? People love to just make stuff up when they have a chance, little chance for a little notoriety. That's a chance. Fifth bullet point, bro, just teach someone Russian and have him defect. I mean, why go through the, why are you swapping identities? Just teach the guy Russian. Uh, I touched on this earlier. Uh, Oswald, uh, uh, 
Armstrong puts out the theory that, well, the best, if you teach someone Russian, it's going to be found out by the Soviet Union. They have a defector running around who, who really speaks Russian, and that would endanger the person. So, another bullet point. How do you figure out two unrelated children will look a lot, a lot, enough alike to pass for each other as adults? Well, Armstrong would say about this, they didn't look exactly alike. They look similar. In fact, if you look at discrepancies in like Marine Corps records, it looks like he, he says one of the guys seems to be five foot nine, the other seems to be five foot eleven. So but still, this is a valid critique. And even another critique is that how do you take ten year old kids and how do you decide they're both gonna want to be secret agents someday? You know, like, like Mom, I don't want to be a secret agent. So it's tough to have people in parallel lives from the point of children. And then sort of know they're going to go along with their, their plan, your plans when they're 18. Valid. In some cases, specific witnesses have been critiqued. Uh, Palmer McBride, who I mentioned earlier, people have attacked that story. Ralph Le Leon Yates, that's the uh, hitchhiker with the curtain rod story. People have criticized that. And there's other ones too. So you can't just swallow in anything that every witness says. And there are trenchant uh, critiques in these regards. Uh, uh, Armstrong's been criticized for a selective narrative that leaves out some inconvenient testimonies. I mean, anyone, even if you write a 970 page book, it's going to be a selective stuff, right? I mean, you can't include everything. In fact, when I, when I, we said Roger Craig saw a guy jumping into a Nash Rambler station wagon, Roger Craig said this guy had brownish blonde hair. So that's not Oswaldy. Could have just been the sunlight. Could have just been. Uh, not seeing things well, or maybe the guy really had blonde hair. It wasn't Oswald. So, um, again, uh, w one aspect of John Armstrong is he doesn't expose himself to sort of critiques and criticism. He he stays off the message boards. He has this sort of mini-me named uh, Jim Hargrove who maintains his website and does get on the message boards and defend the Harvey and Lee thesis. But John Armstrong sort of sits in his tower and releases articles and this book and appears on podcasts. Um, another critique is the Oswald autopsy and eventually the exhumation. This is mixed evidence, I would say. Um, the autopsy noted scars on Oswald's body, you know, down to a minute level, but it didn't note a few things. It didn't note he, 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 Oswald shot himself in the arm by accident in the Marines and that left a scar. This scar is not noted in the autopsy. When Oswald was a kid, he had a mastoidectomy. It's the mastoid is the bone behind your ear here. He had an infection and had that removed. There doesn't, there isn't a note of the mastoid scar in the autopsy. Uh, John Armstrong would say, well, that's because the guy getting the getting the autopsy, the the dead guy, was not the Lee Oswald who had those other things happen to him. That was the other Oswald. Then there was an exhumation in the 80s. Uh, that was identified by dental records as being Oswald. There's mixed evidence as to whether a mastoid uh, uh, scar was in the skull from the exhumation. But also, that exhumation had all the teeth. Uh, John Armstrong says that Lee, Harvey, Lee Oswald, the other Oswald, the original guy born in New Orleans Oswald, had a tooth knocked out as a kid and had a prosthesis. Uh, and there's even a little bit of Marine Corps documentation about having a dental prosthesis instead of a tooth there. So it's a bit of a mess, the autopsy and the exhumation. There's also the photographic evidence. I mean, this montage right here, this is from a book actually published before Harvey and Lee called The Search for Lee Harvey Oswald, I believe. It's on the shelf here somewhere by Robert Grodin. Um, John Armstrong would say there's exactly two people represented in these photos. But even before the Harvey and Lee book came out, there were people looking at these photos going, hey, this looks like two different people. And so, you know, you can look at these photos and decide what you want. You, you would also look at the photos of his mother, Marguerite Oswald. John Armstrong swears up and down those photos look like two different people. Uh, I'm not convinced the photographic evidence is the strongest evidence in support of this thesis especially in the case of Marguerite. So anyway, if you wanted to uh, look at John Armstrong's work specifically, first of all, there's a website, harveyandlee.net. Uh, it has a ton of articles, including uh, the Marguerite Oswald's article, many other articles. And for you Barney Miller fans out there, 
the article about Steve Landisberg and Oswald apparently causing a ruckus in New York in the 1960s when Oswald was in the Soviet Union. If you look at the book cover of Harvey and Lee here, Armstrong contends this photo is cut in half and that it's actually two different people. That's, that's an Oswald military ID there. And uh, Armstrong asserts this is a composite photo, the left half of the photo being one person, the right half being another, and that this was actually a relatively uh, not rare thing in spycraft to actually form composite photos like this. That book, you may or may not be able to order that book and get it today. Armstrong had to get it printed in China because no publisher in the United States wanted a piece of it. Uh, so there's a very limited supply. There was a little bit of a spike of interest in this book when Rob Reiner did his uh, podcast series recently. Uh, so you can order the book if you want, if, and if it still exists. It's like 80 to $90. Uh, if you can't order it or don't want to order it, PDFs of this book exist online. Don't worry that you're stealing food from the mouth of John Armstrong. He knows the PDFs are out there. He doesn't care. He just wants people to read it. He just wants people to become researchers. He wants people to evaluate the evidence. This book is meticulously footnoted and indexed. It's a great resource. Even people who hate the Harvey and Lee thesis say this book is an amazing resource, that John Armstrong was an absolute document hound, and he dug up documents. And they're all footnoted and discussed here, and even if you don't like the theory. I'm not the kind of person who would read a 970-page PDF, but maybe you are. But it's out there if you want to look at it. I think it's a hypnotic and interesting book, and if you care about the JFK assassination at all, I suggest grabbing it and reading it. There's also podcasts floating around regarding the JFK assassination. There's still weekly and monthly podcasts about the JFK assassination. It's amazing. If you're new to the case, a great podcast I think you could pick up is called Solving JFK. It's the one in the middle here. It's a gentleman in Ohio named Matt Crumpton. He did an entire first season just on the sort of mechanics of the assassination and a sort of overview, which is what happened at Dealey Plaza, what's the story with Jack Ruby, how many, does the evidence, how, the Warren Commission evidence about shots and this and that. His whole second season is an Oswald season. It's in flight right now. Each episode's about a half hour. It's really good stuff. Mr. Crumpton is very passionate about this. I think if you're a good listener, you can absorb a lot of this information, even if you're new to the case. I highly recommend solving the JFK podcast. Uh, the three podcasts on the left are kind of related. The Dallas Action, The Lone Gunman are two podcasts run by a single guy. And then those two guys run a joint podcast called Quick Hits. It's um, I like the Quick Hits one where they're together better than either one they do individually. It's not JFK 101 stuff. They do sort of deeper dives. Uh, I would maybe recommend looking into this if you get a little more well-versed in the case or you see a very, very specific episode you want to listen to. Uh, these guys are not terribly friendly to the Harvey and Lee thesis, but that's fine. Uh there's another YouTube channel here called America's Untold Stories. They don't just do JFK assassination, but they do a lot of JFK assassination stuff. They'll do deep dives on specific people. They'll do an episode like an hour just on Larry Crayford, who I mentioned. They'll do an hour just on Jim Braden. They'll do an hour on extremely obscure topics uh, in the assassination. They'll do multi-part series and other aspects of the assassination. Uh, one of the co-hosts, Grobert, he's a screenwriter and a, a former journalist. He... Uh, has wrote a big Oswald teleplay, a, a sort of a, a fictional teleplay that I think is getting released on one of the streaming services. So they're really into it. Uh, it's it's fun. They're funny. It's a humorous podcast. Uh, you can get into America's Untold Stories. More recently, I have found a podcast called Out of the Blank. They do. He does maybe an episode. He does a lot of shows. Maybe once every two or three weeks is one related to JFK. I recommend Out of the Blank. Uh, just as a podcast in general, never mind just the JFK stuff. And then there's the OG of JFK podcast, Black Op Radio. This has been a regular show every week since 1999. 1999, I mean, what what the hell were you doing back then? Just Was that real play or how, how were you doing a podcast then? It was, the, the, the word podcast didn't even exist. So it was MP3s, it was real play or whatever. They've been doing a show for 25 years. <clears throat> it's a weekly show. Maybe a good 75% of the time it's JFK assassination specific. This is the only venue I know of where John Armstrong has done extensive interviews. 
So he's done one or two this year. I have copies of all the ones he's done years ago. He'll do you know two hours just on Marguerite Oswald. He'll do four hours on the Tippett shooting. He'll he's done a bunch of shows. He did one or two where he did Q and A, but not a ton. So if uh, this podcast is criticized a little for interviewing the same old eighty year old dudes over and over, I mean it's been around a long time, but you know stick it in your podcast feeder and and see if you like it. Whew, that's it. That's the end. What do you think of the Harvey and Lee thesis? I mean, there's there's so much going on. That was a whirlwind tour. There's a lot of stuff I skipped. We didn't even discuss Oswald stuff that doesn't relate to the Harvey and Lee thesis. There's so much other interesting stuff. There's whatever, the backyard photos. There's the rifle. There's the quote-unquote communist activities. There's so much. It's a fascinating topic. Hopefully, I've wet your interest a little bit. You, there's many, many resources out there if you want to get a little more into this. So I hope you enjoyed. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on that post notification bell, baby.